afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Superior Health Quality Alliance Roundtable Conversation. My name's Kim Heft, and I am joined by my colleagues. Now get this, all these J's, all right? My colleagues, Jerry, Julie, Janae, as well as our guest speaker, our very own Superior Health Quality Improvement Advisor, Jana Broughton. So this is our second roundtable event for the new year. So for those that have joined us last year, you know, welcome back. And if you're new to our events, uh, we're really glad to have you here. We host this event on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month, and it consists of a 30 minute educational session followed by a Q&A session. Now we hope that you'll be able to join us every week. And one thing I would ask of you is that if you have any of those things, you know, those pebbles in your shoe, things that you're struggling with or trying to figure out, you know, maybe that could be a topic for a future event. So send me a direct message in the Zoom chat, whatever you need to do, and we could add that for a future session. There's going to be a survey at the end of this session, which we're gonna ask you to take just a few minutes to complete. And Julie is going to put the link for the PowerPoint presentation in chat momentarily. Use that chat box to share any comments, questions, anything else that pops into your mind during the presentation. And then we're gonna use that for discussion, discussion during our Q&A. Now, but before we get started with our QAPI presentation, we want to take a few minutes to discuss um, some recent news on whether the Pfizer uh, COVID bivalent vaccine increases stroke risk for people over 65. Now, the majority, of course, we know of our nursing home residents are over 65. You have families, staff, residents reading and listening to the news. So we felt it would be helpful to shed some light on what we do know about this topic. So, Jerry, would you like to shed some light on, uh, on this, uh, this new news we've heard recently? I would love to. Thanks, Kim. Um, and as Kim said, I, it was... On January 13th, I believe when it first came out um, from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention that they announced um, that through the safe or the vaccine safety monitoring system that is known as the vaccine safety data link system, they picked up a safety signal that there was a possible link um, for the Pfizer, it's just for the Pfizer COVID-19 bivalent mRNA um, vaccine. And the, this signal they were seeing was an increased risk for stroke in people over 65 and of course 65 and older. Um, the CDC and FDA then both together issued, um, they did some preliminary work and issued their preliminary findings. Um, and this was findings through their monitoring of the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine safety um, through many different sources that they use um, to gather that data. Um, and since then, they've issued another finding. They found um, that after reviewing all that data and the, and the data in the data link system um, and many other monitoring systems, the, the statistical signal is lower than actually previous signals that we've seen for other vaccine issues. And they've concluded that it's very unlikely that there's a true clinical risk of stroke associated with Pfizer's bivalent vaccine. Unfortunately, I think a number of you and all of us have probably seen this in the news and the news doesn't always go into the depth or people just hear the headline and they don't find out all the supporting data or the fact that it's unlikely. I know I've gotten a number of questions. So all this um, information that's out there is really confusing unless you can dig into the meat of it. Um, so I will share a couple of different links or actually three different links. One's a, a Q&A form that you can use to answer questions from your residents or their families. And then just two of the supporting documentation. One is the preliminary findings that the CDC and FDA put out and then um, information um, from uh, health, uh, healthcare organizations for assisted livings. 
Um, but really the top takeaways here are that after extensive review of the latest vaccine safety data, federal health officials have said that there's very unlikely that there's a true clinical risk of a stroke associated with Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, excuse me, bivalent booster. Um, the safety systems that monitor COVID-19 vaccine safety, they're the most extensive in U.S. history. So there's a lot of data and they've done a lot of uh, research on this. And the COVID-19 vaccines and updated boosters are really safe. Um, um, getting the vaccine remains the best defense against serious illness and hospitalization due to COVID-19. And I think the other key thing here, again, is it was about Pfizer's COVID-19 bivalent booster. It wasn't about um, Moderna's. So I will make sure I get all that information in chat. And if you have any questions, let us know. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. And yeah, please um, take a couple minutes um, while we will continue the presentation. But if you do have any questions, uh, please put them in chat. And also, if you would just put in chat, I'm curious to know from our audience if based on this new this news that I'm, I, you know I've seen it on actual um, the news TV and then articles if this question has come up in your facilities like maybe from facility from facilities from residents or staff or what have you if they even um, mentioned anything so I'm curious to know about that okay um, well, with that being said, uh, today we are going to be talking about QAPI, Updates, Audits, and Infection Control. And um, with that being said, I am going to welcome Jana Broughton, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I, if, with your permission, I am going to turn my camera off because I shared with Kim earlier, I am somebody that talks with her hands, and I would hate to be distracting <laughs> with that behavior. So I'm going to turn my camera off so that we can talk. And we're going to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I know very few people would be like, really, Dana, Quappy? <laughs> um, I've been doing healthcare for 30 years. And one of the things that I've learned about healthcare is that we have a lot of data, right? So Kim, if you want to go ahead and advance that first slide. Um, hey, Jana, just before yeah. we move on, I noticed that when you're, you turn your uh, turn your head off to the side, we're having difficulty hearing you. I don't know, however, that is your microphone is to your uh, a computer, but um, just so you know, you're kind of fading in and out if you turn your head. Okay, is that better, Kim? Uh, well, we're gonna find out, I think so, but I'll go to the next slide. All right, well, let's go to the next slide and I pulled my computer closer to me. Oh yes, yes, it, it sounds better, yep. Okay, perfect. So today we're going to talk about QAPI, and um, it's not necessarily a topic that a lot of people talk about and think about when it comes to infection control, but we want to cover a few items today, and this is meant to be very, very high level. Um, you know, I'm going to first talk about what are the new requirements for QA, quality assurance and performance improvement, and then secondly, the QAPI education component um, that was released in October. What is a best practice for QAPI infection control reporting? What are best practices? And then how to determine what data you should be reviewing? And once you have that data, what do you do with all that data? Um, and we're gonna follow it and wrap it up with a scenario discussion about how to determine uh, what data you should be seeking for review. And then what do you do with it? So as we go on to the next slide, these are the objectives for today going to have a brief overview uh, so that you understand what the new re requirements of the revised state operations manual that were published in October of 2022. Uh, be able to state an understanding of what your infection preventionist should be reporting on at scheduled QAPI meetings, and then recognizing data that should or could be used to drive your QAPI processes. So first, let's delve into on the next slide. The new state operation manual updates. Um, I think this one caught a lot of us off guard in long-term care because we were so focused on other areas of the SOM that changed in October, but deeply embedded in those multiple pages of changes, there was some new wording that came out around F-865, which is your federal F tag on QAPI. And if I were to give you all of the wording changes, it would be multiple pages. 
but I will share with you um, the link to that is at the bottom of this slide. And then if you simply do a search engine and search um, state operation manual changes October 2022 QAPI, you should get multiple um, variety of information about what changed. But what I'm going to talk about today is really what changed in the state operation manual and why it's important for us to look at. So first and foremost, um, as I've highlighted on this page, they talk a little bit about the demonstration of compliance and the wording changed a little bit in regards to data collection and then analysis at regular intervals. That is something that they've teased out a little bit and talked more about um, at length in the wording of F-865. And the demonstration of compliance was also talked about and spelled out a little bit clearer for us, but what they're looking for is not only evidence of systems and reports demonstrating identifying, but report investigation, and there's that word, analysis and prevention of adverse events. So it really, um, they're looking for QAPI to take that systematic, interdisciplinary, comprehensive, and data-driven approach to maintain and improve safety and quality while involving residents and families in practical and creative problem solving. So kind of what I've teased out of this Psalm 4 F865, if we go to the next page, it talks a little bit about what that compliance definition looks like. Um, so in the compliance defined part of it, what they're stating and what are one of the directions to the surveyors to look at compliance overall in regards to F-865 is that it's the summarization of past non-compliance processes. Basically, you may have identified an issue prior to your survey and as part of your QAA data collection, you have that data, but did you um, make that good faith attempt in actions taken as a whole, they have to have evidence that that good faith recognition not only identified the problem, but that you worked towards correcting the quality deficiency. So I think um, we're gonna talk about this further when we go into the live example at the bottom as we go through the presentation and we talk about infection control. Those of us out working in the field with multiple nursing homes across a few states are starting to see a little uptake from providers reporting that they're being tagged out on F-865 when they're being tagged at a widespread or patterned quality deficiency, quality of care deficiencies specifically. So I think it's really important to do that deep dive into the changes in the SOM and read F-865 and look at your specific QAPI policies and processes for your building or company. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk about the other part that changed, um, which is F944, which is quality improvement and the education requirements uh, of QAPI. We all know that staff have to be educated on QAPI, but what changed in F944 and what they're putting emphasis on is something that has changed dramatically in all buildings across the country. And that's the definition of who your staff are. And they teased out in the staff definition very specifically to include contractual and volunteer relationships for both direct and indirect functions in your building. And these are individuals that provide services under a contractual arrangement. So that could be anything or any, anybody from a physician to a therapist, to nursing, to a nursing assistant, dietary staff, housekeeping staff, those are your contractual staff. Um, the volunteer component of this, I think, is very interesting because th they've teased that out to say, hey, your volunteers need to be educated about your QAPI program and the education that is mandatory, as defined under 944, is that they must be educated on not only the QAPI program, but that QAPI program includes the goals and various elements of your program and how the facility intends to implement the program. The training also needs to include your staff's role in the facility's quality improvement program. 
How does a volunteer, for example, communicate concerns, problems, or opportunities for improvements to the facility's QAA committee? And as updates are made to your facility's QAA or QAPI program, or the goals are changed, how are you educating your staff? So I really think the crux of what they're getting at in these changes is that it's no longer a one and done annual high level QAPI education that we give or on orientation. From looking at the examples that we're seeing of the tags and what the surveyors are talking about on the field is that training should be ongoing and support current scope and standards of practice as well as your facility's current goals and programs around QAPI. Meaning what are you currently working on? How are you working on it? Why are you working on it? And what are, what are you doing? And what is the staff's expectation in that? Um, and the following, the other part of this is there needs to be a process in place to track staff participation in the required QAPI trainings. So just share this a little bit uh, to give you kind of a background of why we're talking about QAPI so early in 2023, that I think with the state operations manual changes, uh, might have caught some of us off guard and that the surveyors have been trained and educated as part of their updates to really start focusing in on QA and the QAPI process in buildings. And they're given actual um, directives to tag out in these two areas for pattern or widespread issues with quality. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this presentation today and talk about um, where we're going to go next, which is on infection prevention and infection prevention reporting to the QAPI committee. So on the next slide, we're going to change gears a little bit. And we're going to talk about your infection prevention and the report out to the QAPI committee and the QAPI meeting. And I recognize, and I'm sure you recognize, that most organizations, you have a very structured report. Um, a lot of organizations have a very structured QAPI meeting. A lot of it's online in most cases. You look at specific data sets. You report off on specific data sets. And for the infection preventionist, it generally includes tracking data. That's where they report out on their mapping of infections, their line listing of infections that were discovered in the building for a time period. And usually it's a month at a time. Some buildings do it quarterly. And it just depends again on your facility's policies and your corporate process for that report out. It often includes antibiotic usage, antibiotic stewardship, and whether or not the antibiotic met the criteria, the McGear criteria for usage. And if not, the, uh, the audits often also then include a written summarization and recap um, from your medical providers on the use of antibiotics. And of course, recently in the last three years, because of the COVID pandemic, we've now started seeing report outs on immunization, your COVID vaccines, your flu shots, your pneumonia vaccines, uh, TB tests, for example. Many buildings and companies also include staff infections in getting good data to include staff concerns. Um, I wanna be careful and recognize though that when you're reporting out on staff infections that you make sure that you're upholding PHI and PII for your staff uh, during those report outs. And these are data reports. Um, infection preventionists come to these meetings and I don't know about you, but I always feel like when the poor infection preventionist comes to the meeting, they just have all this data that they're sharing with us. And it can be like overwhelming for the rest of the group in that QA meeting. And we just look at the data. And my question to you is, we give this information, we make the infection preventionist, we have them do all these tasks with collecting data, but many companies, and I see many instances where it's often up to the infection preventionist to correct or put concern or to put corrections or processes in place immediately and kind of on their own, in their own little silo um, for issues that they identify on their process mapping or line listing. And of course, immediate change has to happen if it's something that is gonna happen to be an, you know, an immediate issue for somebody or could cause harm. However, I think we're missing an opportunity for our infection prevention um, preventionists to really get that support of the QAPI committee when their data is reviewed. Um, 
you know, it should be an intentional process with multiple people interdisciplinary where the data is reviewed, dissected and looked at for trends and patterns as well as causal factors. And it, it shouldn't just be a group of clinicians, right? This should be interdisciplinary. And we should include non-traditional infection preventionists. And what is a non-traditional infection preventionist? I wanna share a story and a great example of what a non-traditional approach to infection preventionist looks like. Um, during the early pandemic, a great friend of mine was an administrator and she was a QA guru. She's somebody that I've always emulated her expertise on QAPI. She had uh, her building, their building, was one of the very first buildings in Michigan to have a widespread outbreak early on in the pandemic. I mean, it was widespread, awful, multiple levels of care. And during the height of this outbreak is when it was right in the midst of that when the infection prevention education was being pushed out by the CDC and it was new and we were asking people to become specialists in infection prevention and to get a nurse designated or a clinician designated. She took it upon herself to request that her entire management team took that infection prevention program together that was offered by the CDC. They dedicated a couple hours a week to sit down and talk about the modules together and to do the education together. Her purpose was to get her team focused on infection prevention using their lenses, meaning maintenance would use kind of their expertise in their lens. Dietary would come at it from what they knew about infection prevention and foodborne illness. And she created this interdisciplinary amount of expertise to create a process to prevent further spread of COVID in their building. And then due to that staff, due to her management team now being armed with this education and this new view of infection control, they were able to open one of the first COVID recovery units in the state of Michigan, which was in the state of Michigan, a COVID recovery unit actually took COVID positive residents from other buildings. And I think they had at one time like 60 beds designated to this COVID positive resident population. And she, they did this and they kept that unit open for a period of two years without a further outbreak in their building. Not only did they have that unit open without further outbreak in their, their own population, the building also was under special scrutiny because all of these uh, COVID recovery facilities had additional heightened surveys. And they were surveyed three times in less than an 18 month period with zero citations on infection, prevent, on infection control to the point that the surveyors asked, what did you do differently? The only thing that they did different was that they educated their, and they took a, an interdisciplinary team approach to QA. So why is that important? As we go to the next slide, we're gonna talk about that. Um, it's an all hands on deck approach to looking at infection prevention. Your infection preventionist, the infection preventionist does report out to the QAPI committee and it should be a report out and a report back. So I say to people, you know, we talk about QAPI and early on back when they first rolled out this QA and then PI program, they talked about PIPs and they talked about uh, you know, improvement programs and projects. And I think when you look at infection prevention, everybody has a piece of it and they may have some answers to what is going on in your line listing or your mapping that you might not be thinking about for your clinical eye. And from a staff education um, perspective on this, you know, reviewing what staff have been educated on is part of your line listing. You know, one of the early on things that this building identified is that hand washing was a concern, but it was hand washing around volunteers and life enrichment, actually life enrichment staff, um, educating the life enrichment staff on how to hand wash, but how to do hand sanitation and hand washing with residents pre and post activities. So I think, you know, during their visits, so I think there's always opportunity for us when we look at an uh, interdisciplinary approach to what that infection preventionist is. We need to remember they're not an island, right? They're not alone on their little infection preventionist island. We need to surround them with support and be that uh, process improvement eye and lens for them. Which brings me to slide nine, where we talk about 
changing your view. What that building did is they changed their team perception. And one of the things when you talk about changing your view and changing your team's perception, be fun about it. Think of yourself as a team of explorers. Um, when it comes to QA and you know, doing investigation and looking at your data, it's like a deep dig and exploration. It's like an archeological dig and you're peeling back the layers of what happened and why did it happen this way? And what did they do differently to not have it happen in one particular area? And you know, when you're presenting this to your floor staff, you can get creative about it. We are all weary of masking and PPE and hand hygiene and all of the things that have happened in the last three years. I, I like to say it's 2023, it's a new year. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit towards the end, but this is an opportunity for us to get creative. Pull your floor staff into learning about infection control to help battle that weariness. Instead of being pulled, have them help you tell the story and have them help you do that investigation. Ask them to look at it through their lens and what are they seeing as potential issues or reasons for your data to be occurring. So now we're gonna talk about investigation. And on the next slide, we talk about where do we start? Well, using the SOM as our guide. And in the state operation manual, they talk about what is a quality deficiency, meaning what is a deficiency that falls under this tag. And when it's not a quality deficiency is a deficiency per the definition is anything outside of acceptable parameters of outcomes, anything that could be considered a near miss, actual harm, potential risk, or even a one-time occurrence that results in a negative outcome. Those could be construed as quality deficiencies. And we see that in our 2567s. We see that on the F tags. Um, so what I encourage buildings to do is when you're starting to do your investigation into what the data is telling you, use the SOM as your guide. You know, make sure that your staff and that your quality assurance committee understands basic understanding of what the state operations manual tells you the responsibility of a QAPI committee is and what we're supposed to do with our data and how we're supposed to respond to it, but then use your company or corporate parameters and policies. Uh, use industrial standards, industry standards of practice, standards or norms. Um, compare your quality data to others. You know, how many times do you go out to nursing home compare and look at other people's data on their five-star rating? What are their quality indicators compared to you? Where do you fall uh, in your region among other buildings? And what is it stating to you? What are you, um, you know, looking at it from a different lens? Look at it broadly, but then look at it also possibly from your resident's perspective. What are your residents telling you that your, quality, your issues are? Where are the parameters that are important to them? And what is an acceptable parameter or outcome from a resident's perspective or a family's perspective? Um, Sometimes it's hard to hear, you know, those parameters and what they think we should be focused on and what we think we should be focused on. And we're like Mars, Venus sometimes, but I think it's important that we figure out a happy medium so that we can get to some level of satisfaction and compliance around quality. And the last point I wanna make about this slide with investigation, again, use your staff. Do not, you know, I think we get so busy that we think about this as a top-down process for inquiry, and it really needs to be a bottom fed up. When we looked at the SOM and it talked about involving staff and residents, that really is what they're talking about. Using that, you know, frontline experience to feed up to those of us in QAPI on what we should be looking at and why we should be looking at it. So now we're gonna talk about a real life scenario. Um, on the next slide, we're gonna do a few polling questions. And Kim, this is where we're gonna step in and do some polling questions. But the scenario that we're gonna talk about here is immunization acceptance by residents and responsible parties. We're gonna use a fictitious facility called Shady Pines. And Shady Pines nursing is reporting that only 41% of their residents have received their bivalent COVID booster in their recent copy report to their committee. 
So the first polling question, is this percentage outside the parameter of current standards for vaccine outcomes? Yes or no? And then is there anything further that they should be reporting uh, to meet the standards of the CLAPI process? Yes or no? Okay, Jana. So um, people are putting in their answers and thus far we are, well, give me just a second here. <laughs> let them finish, let them finish. I'm, I'm jumping the gun, finish. jumping yeah. the gun. Um, okay. Very good. All right, are you so, seeing them too, Jana? I am, and I'm seeing it overwhelmingly. And the answer is yes. Uh, it is outside of the parameters of current standards for uh, vaccination outcomes. And I think that's a debatable discussion, but I think we would like to see um, anywhere between 85 and 95% of all residents vaccinated. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, on the vaccination team, if that is what you're looking for from a percentage of residents to be up to date with their uh, boosters. Yes. Is, that, a, we, is yes. that correct, Kim? That is the percentage. We are looking for um, residents to uh, uh, facilities to have greater than 80% vaccination rates would be ideal. Okay. So obviously this facility is not um, at that level. So that means that they have additional work to do, right? So this is something, so what does that look like? Let's go back to our PowerPoint and let's talk about what that looks like. So it's telling us um, that no, you know, we're not meeting the standards for vaccination outcomes. And so what else do we need to do? So on the next slide where we talk about not stopping at the data, Susie, the infection preventionist at Shady Pines knows there is more to the story than of why only 41% are boosted. So where do you think she needs to start? What does she need to look at to get the full picture of why the number is below the acceptable standards? And I think this is where, you know, as a, a practitioner, as a former administrator, that this could be like overwhelming to think about, oh gosh, where do I start with all this data? I know we have a problem, but how do we tease out why we have the problem? And doesn't that take a long time to, to do this process? And I'm gonna to say to you that um, yes, in the CMS examples of Quapi, they use the program called the five whys. Some people are a big fan. I'm gonna share with you, I'm not a big fan of five whys right off the get-go when it looks at how come something is happening. I prefer to do something like the Fishbone or Ishikawa, not just because it has a fun name, it is a fun name, but I, I like it because when you use a scatter chart or a whiteboard to just throw ideas up on a board, people are able to participate and give ideas outside of a narrow scope, such as a five Y where you start with one and you go to the next and you delve down deeper. I like to use a different type of process with thinking so that you can kind of collect a lot of ideas. So we're gonna talk about that. So scatter board, a scatter is just a whiteboard with thrown out ideas or thoughts captured, and then you sequence them into patterns or trends. And what we do with that data collected determines the pattern scope and how you grid it out. And what I mean by grid it out, I mean, is it a problem? Have you identified now through your process that the problem is a high expense problem to fix? with a high impact? Is it a low expense problem to fix with a low impact, vice versa? So you kind of like, okay, what priority should this be? If I discover that we're at 41% and we think we have five or six causes of why we're only at 41%, how do I determine which one's the priority? And what do I do with that? So when you talk about that and you look at how you create um, process improvement around your information or the data that you've collected, floppy education or quality improvement education goes back to a guy named Deming that was, and it started really in automobile plants. However, it's been translated over to healthcare where I think it's been immeasurably successful. In a plan, do, study, act cycle, 
when you're studying your data, you're basically coming into that PDSA cycle at the S. You're studying your data and that is okay. I think where people get hung up on is that they think they need to start with plan. And no, the act, the whole cycle is a study, act, do, plan, however, it's, it's cyclical. So studying it being looking at your data is telling you that you're obtaining information about a process that might not be working any longer or a process that's broken. And then we next talk about the action of doing, and then we talk about what we're going to do to fix it, to see how it's doing, you know, how we're doing on the improvement. A lot of high level conversation. I'm going to stop it right there. And we're going to go into our whiteboard conversation back to why we only have 41% of our residents boosted. So on the next slide, throw out some examples in the chat. And I don't know, Kim, if you can get in and like give me some ideas on the chat and we can talk about it. But chat out your thoughts. What causes low up to date vaccination rates in your buildings? Why are people stuck at a percentage of, of low vaccination or low booster? What are some of the ideas? And Kim, if you want to give me anything that you're seeing in chat, because I'm not seeing the chat on my side because I have my slides up. Oh, absolutely. For sure. So if anybody types anything in from the chat, I would greatly appreciate it. This is be participatory, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to have some ideas. And no idea, right? So one thing when you do like a whiteboard exercise with a team or a group of people, you need to set some parameters about what that looks like. No thought is a bad idea. We don't talk about each other as being lesser or better at ideas or thoughts. And one of the reasons to do a whiteboard with an interdisciplinary is everybody uses their filter or their lens of expertise to talk about the why through their, their, you know, their lens. And I did this with a group of people just you know, randomly talked about what do you think causes uh, low up-to-date vaccines? And a few of the thoughts that I've seen, um, and overwhelmingly one uh, from buildings, is a lack of consent. Families and responsible parties say no to vaccines. Staff time. We don't have the staff. We don't have the availability of a nurse to give the vaccines. My infection preventionist is working the floor because I don't have nursing. Vaccine availability. We're hearing that also has been an issue. Um, not able to get vaccines into the building. or probably in the last two months, one of the ones that we're seeing frequently is a recent outbreak of COVID in your building and residents were recently positive and the clinician wants to be safe and wait 60 to 90 days before you give the next booster. And I think that's probably, you know, a large part of what I would say is part of the why of why you're at 41%. Big high level. But I would challenge you when you think about this, and then we go to the next slide and we use that Ishikawa or that fishbone. On this diagram, this is the like studying, it's like teasing out all those ideas. So under category one, you could have responsible parties not willing to give consent. Okay, why aren't they giving consent? Is it because they haven't consented to any vaccine or is it specifically the booster? And if it's specifically the booster, why the booster versus the vaccine? Is it the same person making the call to the families that of the residents, you know, that 59% that said no, which percentage of them and where do they live in your building? Have you mapped it out? Have you looked at who made the phone calls for the consents? Do you have a script for the consents? Have you educated responsible parties? Do you even have education to get them on the booster outside of what you've gotten from your pharmacy? Do you know where to send people to get education? These are things that you could put into your studying of the problem. Those are all food for thought. Those are all things to potentially look at. Um, resident education and resident engagement. Are the residents just weary of the shot? Are the residents telling you, I've already had COVID, I can't get it again? Um, what education have you offered your residents? Who's approaching your residents to obtain those consents? You know, those are things that you could tease out and ask about that percentage of residents. What about vaccine uh, delivery, being able to get vaccines in your building and being able to give them to residents? 
Do you have a staffing issue? Have you reached out to a health department? Have you reached out to your physician's office, your pharmacy, your QIO, Superior Health? We have resources, right? Have you reached out and asked about support and help and where to go to get that support and help to give those vaccines? So those are all examples about the investigation. They're answering those five whys, but utilizing in my mind, each of these categories could be a five why conversation about the same issue, which is your low booster acceptance. So from an infection preventionist, going back to your IP person again, this is not only their responsibility. This is an issue that should be categorically across the board with your QAPI committee involved. Your life enrichment person, your housekeeper may hold the keys to getting a resident from no to yes on a booster because that may be the person that has the best relationship and trust with that resident and you don't know about it because you're having your infection preventionist only respond to this through a clinical perspective. And I think those are the conversations and discussions that can happen when your QA committee, your QA group is interdisciplinary, involved, multi-levels of the organization, and you talk about infection prevention with that different lens and that different view. So I think, when you talk about the next step being, you know, so this is the plan do study act. So we're still in the study act. The next step is your action step. What are you going to do to work on the next process? What are you going to do differently? Um, and what is the goal of that action? So 41%, you know, you're at 41%. Would an acceptable goal be to get to 90% by the next month? Maybe, but probably not. I would set, and I would argue that from a, from a satisfaction of your staff participating in process improvement, setting small attainable goals over a longer period of time makes sense and you will find more satisfaction and more buy-in. And there is and there's data to demonstrate that that's successful. When you think about, for example, weight loss, right? You set small incremental goals uh, of changing your behaviors and your habits to get to that end goal, the end goal. But if you set this big, hairy, audacious goal, and that's the only vision that you have, and then you don't succeed, failure is going to be felt really hard. That's why small incremental goals are so important, especially if you're involving floor staff. And I would also argue with you that um, from a from an F tag perspective and from a quality indicator perspective, I always stated as an administrator, I know many agree with this, good to be above average, but don't be an outlier. <laughs> so if the quality indicator, Kim, you stated it was 80 to 85%, you wanna be in that sweet spot so that you're recognizing and you're demonstrating that you're in compliance with what the expected role is. And if that goal post changes to 90%, you now have a new goal to work on, but if it goes backwards to 75%, you are an outlier, but you're an outlier in a good way. And it's because of best practices. So action is probably more critical than just you know, the other parts of it. It's what you do with all of the information that you've obtained. And that goes back to that conversation about F865, that you're taking action, that you're not just doing verbalizing to a surveyor that yes, we recognize we had a problem, we found the problem in our, our data. They're gonna say, yeah, so what? What did you do differently? What's your action about the problem? What did you do to fix it? And I would also say to you that this could be your PIP. This is your project, this is your process improvement. And, or it could be a past non-compliance and you could put it into past non-compliance. And I hear often, well, Jana, our surveyors don't accept past non-compliance. I'm not saying pass non-compliance to try to get through a survey. I'm saying pass non-compliance for the sake of saying, yeah, we recognize we weren't in compliance with this F tag, and here's what we did. Here's our QA data. Here's our action steps. Here's the education that we took. Here's the trainings that we did. Here's our additional outcomes post-training and education, and here's that plan, do, study, act cycle in action, and oh, by the way, we've documented it, and here it is. Whether or not they accept it doesn't really matter. 
you've improved quality. You've improved your staff's recognition of why copy is important and you've created that thought process of how it's supposed to work. Now, I do wanna share with you that sometimes your actions don't always demonstrate success. We might try something and we're like, poof, missed the mark on that one. Do we forget about it? No, we go back and we put that concern back into that PDSA cycle and we start a new plan. Maybe we didn't go with the right category up here on our issue, you know, Ishikawa. We maybe were too far away from it, or maybe an action just didn't happen because we didn't, we overthought it and we were going to do this big education and it didn't happen. So, you know, as long as the action was done for your documented plan and the outcome didn't change, you can state you're going back to that cycle to try a new action and you're going to try something different. Because success is defined, right, by trying something different. You can get to success multiple ways, and it can be defined through your actions. So on the last slide, which I'm going to leave you with this thought, um, we barely touched the topic of QA today. I mean, QA, PI, that's like a full day discussion and training. But I hope we were able to create a few kernels of new thoughts or ideas or options about how to use your QAPI to improve performance. And I would share with you that this is your opportunity to start fresh. There's are new requirements. It's a new year. It's 2023. We are looking at infection control processes differently. COVID is now part of our daily lives and not the chaos that it was two years ago. It is just different now. I strongly encourage and hope that you can look at 2023 as a year of opportunity for change and change the way you view things. Because as the quote states, you seldom improve quality by cutting costs, but you can also often cut costs by improving quality. And I leave that thought with you and we'll open it up for questions, Kim. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jana. That was a really good, good um, presentation. I really appreciate your input. And boy, aren't you, it is so correct that you, we could talk about this coffee process uh, all day long. Yes, for sure. This is just icing on the cake. Um, I do, um, yes, please, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself or put a question in chat. But I do want to go back a little bit, Jana. Um, sure. I'm going to find, oh, heck, I don't even know where it is, but I think I can remember that you um, you had your um, example. It was a story of a friend of yours that um, opened up their, you know, their COVID unit and they, but they started with implementing the infection preventionist training to everyone and you, they did it together as a leadership team so that, um, well, you know, we already yep. talked through that. So the question was though, what, what size of, what was the size of this facility? So how many, uh, what was like the census and how many so, residents and staff? That is a great question. It was a 120 bed facility that was primarily short-term rehab at the set of the, at the set of the pandemic. They were running about a 60 bed short term rehab unit. So, half short term rehab, half long term care. So, a very, very busy building. And they also had an assisted living and memory care attached. So, all total, it was about 210 residents residing on that campus. So, a big building. And their um, leadership team. And I, oh, by the way, the other part of this that I wanted to give a caveat, and I didn't give her the shout out on it, was they were not staffed with all their staff. They had agency staff in that building during the pandemic. She had agency nurses and agency nursing assistants working in that building during the pandemic. Now, her leadership team was all her leadership team. They were all part of that company. They were not contracted, including the therapy staff. So that may answer that question. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, did she put any, did she shine any light into, uh, to how difficult or, bar I shouldn't say difficult, or barriers and how she overcame the amount of agency staff and training and having everyone on the same page? So yes, and I think that was um, one of the things that 
they did differently is they created in their staff lounge by their break room uh, camera, like by their, where they punched in and out and by the time clocks, uh, bulletin boards. And they kept their copy goals, very basic. So they disseminated, they took any PII, PHI out of it, but kept them right there by the break room. And every month they updated that. And then they would do a Quizlet or a walk around quiz about the content of that board. And she would hand out candy. <laughs> So, and it was where on, they made all of their agency staff had to punch in and out on that time clock. So everybody coming in and out of that building used that area to review. And they knew that they had to go look at that copy data if they wanted to partake. And they got gave away good sized candy bars. So, you know, during the pandemic, a snack was a snack, right? If you were working because you couldn't, part of Michigan was closed down. We didn't have restaurants open. So, you know, being able to get a treat or a snack, um, it was very low cost. And then the other thing that I just marvel at her ability to do this is she challenged her department managers to subtrain multiple people in her de in their departments to attend Quapi. So every month um, there would be like a QA, like their infection preventionist led a subgroup with like one issue that was brought forward or one data point. And there would be a dietary aid, a life enrichment aid, maybe a social worker in that meeting but it was interdisciplinary and they would meet for like 15 minutes and you would be assigned by a dot on the um, sign-in board that you were attending that meeting that day. You might not have any clue that you were going to that 15 minute stand up during your shift, but you were. And they would solicit feedback at that 15 minute stand up about why they felt something was going on the way it was. These are great, and, great strategies. Yeah. yeah. It was a great strategy. And, you know, I, I think that building is still doing it. She is now retired, but I, that building has been set up for such infection control success that started from a really bad experience. You know, with, I think they had like 19 to 20 residents pop up positive in like a two to three week period during the onset of the outbreak. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so Gina, oh, so Gina, I there's, I'm sorry, we're talking. <laughs> okay, so Jana, um, there's a, a question in chat, and maybe if you could just verify again if contracted staff members, if they fall under the mandatory training and inclusion of the QAPI program. Yes, they do. All contracted staff, the way the SOM writes it is that all contracted staff, whether direct or indirect, you know, that might even be, this is going to be an odd example, but if you contract out for your business office services and they're in that building working, technically, even though they're indirect, they should have some aspect of quappy education to be working in your building. Okay, thank you for that. The other question also, and I, I, I do want to go back to this one. Um, Oh shoot, there's so many, there's so much in here now that I can't find it. It had to do with um, instead of using the rate of, you know, how many uh, residents are, 41% of the residents are vaccinated. The question was, well, why not use the, uh, how many times was the resident offered? The vaccine. I, I think it's a great data point, and I think it would be one I would definitely look at, and I'd want to know who offered it and how was the scripting yeah. done. And of my residents that said yes, or the responsible parties that said yes, what percentage was offered by the same individual? And I'm not, do not, I'm not stating that you point fingers during copy. That is not the intent of your investigation. Not at all. Copy is not meant to be punitive. And I didn't bring that up uh, anywhere in here. This is like a no cause, no harm, foul. Copy is not meant to be that. It's meant to be investigated. So yes, it would be nice to know how many residents actually had it offered. Um, but again, we don't collect that data. This, the government wants to know what percentage has been accepted and what percentage has been given. And I think both are critical pieces that you could do a lot of different things with. So, yeah. One thing I noticed just through my travels is when it comes to finding 
you know, like those things that you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize that, that we should, we are doing this. I know I could, I could say, explain to me the process of this. Not until you get out there. And my example would be work in the kitchen and I am, I'm the registered nurse, work on the kitchen, on the tray line, because we weren't getting, the residents were getting the right, you know, food out on their trays. And it didn't take until like other people that don't work in the kitchen, worked in the kitchen on tray line to start thinking about other things and we resolved our issue. So I think it's about getting out there and really working it. And then you see things in a different light. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's critical to have, you know, I've been an administrator a long time. Tim, you've been a director of nursing in your past. And, you know, we try to avoid, sometimes we don't, those people that absorb, they're like the time sucks of your day, right? They're always in your office and they go, oh, this is wrong and that's wrong and this is wrong. One of my best mentors told me to take those individuals. She said, you need to embrace the negativity. You need to embrace them because there are nuggets of truth in what they're telling you. And if you empower them to be part of the solution and you figure out how to empower them to be part of the solution, you figured out how to lead a building. <laughs> I never thought I quite mastered that, but I always paid attention to that because if they're in your building and they're talking about this and talking about that, or if they're the staff member that nobody wants to orient with because they're cranky or they're negative or they're, you know, maybe they're the person that you need to talk about why is orientation a problem? What is it about the orientation process that they don't like that causes them such aches? So sometimes it's just that different lens and looking at it and putting aside all your own biases and thoughts about it and then kind of looking at it, you know third person kind of coming outside of it and looking at it. Um, residents are, by the way, we all know residents are a, a fount of information, sometimes too much, so, but they often can tell you why something's happening and they're pretty correct. They're pretty close to why the something is happening. So, always include their voice, it's important. Okay. Um... Well, I do have one more, um, let me get it out here, one more polling question I'd like to ask the audience, I think. Here, hold on a minute, I can't find the second one now. Oh, shoot. Okay, don't want that. Oh, Julie, how do I get my second polling question up? Oh, I found it, I found it, there we go, okay. Okay, so curious now, um, after you know, uh, listening to Jana and her presentation, how effective is your Quapi pro your Quapi program? What do you think? Give that a second for people to put in their answers. And while that is happening, I just want to share that. Um, not next week, because I got to remember we're doing these every two, every two weeks now, the second and fourth of Wednesdays of the month, our February 8th session is going to be on behavioral health and addressing challenging behaviors. And on February 22nd, we are going to be talking about fit testing. So that'll go with our infection control theme also. All right, so let me share, share the results here with you. Um, yeah, you know, this actually doesn't surprise me. I feel like there's so many of us out there that we're always like, I think we're doing a pretty good job, but sometimes things, different things, some things get in our way and we take a step back, but you know, it's all about just coming back and revisiting. And like Jana said, going through the cycle and improving where you can. Um, any last words, Gianna? I don't, but thank you all. And you know, we have additional resources. Um, we've just revised. I'm going to give a shout out to Superior Health. We've been revising our website and adding additional materials for company or for buildings to use. So please, if you've already working with a quality advisor, please reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help you with auditing and tools and educational materials for your buildings. We want to see you be you know successful and improve that quality. And I hope 2023 is a change year for everybody. I really do in a positive way. 
Yeah, and there's the resources that we have here, but please do, um, again, Jana said, go to our Superior Health Quality Alliance website under QIO, QIN, you will see uh, valuable resources, a whole bunch just on QAPI and that whole process. So thank you everyone for attending and thank you Jana for presenting and we hope to see all of you in two weeks. Thanks again.